but Eric's aggressiveness would make him an outlaw in Iceland as well. After killing a neighbor in a feud, Eric is banished from Iceland for three years. Having heard reports of new land sighted to the west, Eric sets out to find it for himself. For months, Eric and his crew explore the ice-bound coast of what they believe is a large peninsula, but they find no land suitable for settlement until they round its southern tip. Here, along the western coast, are virgin pastures and sheltered fjords free of ice. In 986, after three years of exploration, Eric returns to Iceland triumphant, as described in the saga of Eric the Red. This same summer, Eric sailed away to colonize the land he had discovered, calling it Greenland, for he maintained that men would be much more eager to go there if the land had an attractive name. Eric the Red was quite clearly, uh, in addition to being a great chief and a great explorer, a great salesman. Certainly in the late 900s where Icelanders were facing widespread erosion, the idea of a new Greenland with fresh pastures to the west must have been very, very attractive. But the 500-mile voyage is a treacherous one. Of the estimated 700 intrepid men and women who accompany Eric to Greenland, only about 400 make it. 11 of the 25 ships either turn back or are lost at sea. Those who survive settle in two areas, the eastern settlement at Cape Farewell and the western settlement 300 miles up the coast. Eric the Red settled at a farm called Brothelied, or Steep Slope Farm, ruins of which still exist in southern Greenland today. It's, of course, got some of the best pasture in the district. Thjodhild, Eric's wife, became a Christian um, and decided she would no longer share his bed. This, as we were told, disturbed him greatly. Um, and eventually she managed to get a church built uh, quite close to their farmstead, which the ruins of which still exist today in Greenland. Despite hardships, by the year 1000, the Greenland colonies are prospering and even begin exporting their own unique goods. In Europe, Polar bears become popular, while in the Middle East, white Arctic falcons are prized as hunting birds. That same year, the sagas tell us, another bold Viking mariner once again sets out to discover a whole new world. His name is Leif Erikson. Leif was the son of Erik the Red, the settler of Greenland. We don't know if Leif is born in Iceland or in Greenland. He may have left as a little boy with his father to go to Greenland. Also, he seems to have inherited Eric's desire for excursion towards these unknown lands in the West. Like his father, Leif follows reports of land sighted to the West. He sets out with three well-provisioned ships and sails toward the unknown. The Norse didn't find a new world. They found what they expected to find, which was a whole series of islands ringing a central big puddle. And if you kept going, eventually you come back to where you started. Crossing the Davis Strait, Leif Erikson's first landfall is on a rocky shore, most likely Canada's Baffin Island. He names it Helluland, meaning land of stone slabs. Turning south, the expedition comes upon a coastline dense with timber. Leif calls it Markland, or woodland. This, almost certainly, is the forested coast of Labrador. But the whereabouts of their next stop has become the subject of intense speculation. Here, the sagas say, the Norsemen find a rich land with many trees, grassy meadows, and rivers teeming with salmon. Leif and his men decide to settle in for the winter and build an encampment of turf houses. One day, while some of the men are out exploring, they find wild grapes growing in the forest. Delighted at the unexpected discovery, Leif names the area Vinland, meaning Wineland. One of the interesting aspects of the Vinland debate is uh, the origin of the name itself, Vinland, Vinland. The problem is wild grapes don't grow north of the St. Lawrence River, and the waters further south are too warm to support Atlantic salmon. These details in the story have led to theories that place Vinland as far south as Cape Cod. The Old Norse word for meadow is Vinland, which is a short vowel, as opposed to Vinland, which is the long vowel. 
and Vinland may mean meadowland or pasture land rather than wine land. In the late 1950s, archaeologist Helge Ingstad and his wife Anna begin a search for evidence of a Viking presence in North America. Following clues in the sagas, they sail down Canada's east coast looking for a place with the same features as Vinland. Their quest would ultimately lead them to the northern tip of Newfoundland, to a place called Lonzo Meadows. Here, the Ingstads find the foundations of nearly a dozen turf houses built in the Norse style. Further proof of the site's Viking origins comes when they unearth two tiny artifacts, a pin used to attach a cloak at the shoulder, and a spindle whorl, a device for spinning wool, both unquestionably of Viking design. Could this be Vinland and the ruins of Leif's houses as described in the sagas? Most experts agree the site at Lonzo Meadows is only a waypoint on the Norse route to Vinland further south. It's a definitely Norse settlement, but perhaps one of the most important things about it is how brief the occupation is. It's quite clear that this was occupied for a few years uh, at most, maybe a decade or so. And the Norse settlement of the Meadows, like the Norse settlement of Vinland itself, in the long term was a failure. According to the sagas, as many as four more expeditions to Vinland take place. All are repeatedly hampered by violent encounters with what the Norse call the Skraelings. Meaning literally wretches in Old Norse, the term is thought to describe both the Thule Eskimos of Canada as well as the native tribesmen of North America. In one battle with the Skraelings, Leif Erikson's brother Torvald is killed by a tribesman's arrow. The last we hear of Leif, he returns to Greenland to succeed his father as chieftain of the colony. He spends the rest of his days preaching Christianity. Here the sagas end, but did the Vikings leave for good? When we return, controversial evidence suggests the Vikings may have gone even further in their explorations of the New World. How this coin got into this Indian village and into this garbage dump has to be a story in itself. Some days of our modern week are named after Viking gods. Wednesday is for Odin, father of the gods. Thursday for the god of thunder, Thor. And Friday for Freyr, the ruler of peace and fertility. History's Mysteries will be back on the History Channel. You're watching History's Mysteries on the History Channel. In 1355 A.D., centuries after the death of Leif Erikson, a priest from Greenland's eastern settlement set sail to visit the church at the smaller western settlement 300 miles up the coast. Father Ivar Barterson had become concerned over reports that the small colony there had been in decline, possibly under attack by Eskimos. But when Father Barterson arrives, no one is there to greet him. The small community, which had endured extremes of weather and distance for 350 years, is abandoned. There are no bodies, no blood, no sign of battle. The people have simply vanished. The Vikings, when they went as far as Greenland and then finally to uh, the North American continent, had reached the end of their limits as far as connections with their, their homelands. They were not numerous enough to deal with the native inhabitants of America, and they weren't even numerous enough to keep up the Viking colony in Greenland. But if they didn't die there, where did the Norsemen of the Western Settlement go? Tantalizing clues have surfaced over the last 200 years that hint at a destination somewhere on the North American continent. But are they real or fraud? In the early 1900s, Canadian Arctic explorer Wilhelmus Stefansson reports encountering a tribe of Inuit living on Ellesmere Island only a few hundred miles from Greenland. That in itself is nothing unusual, but for the fact that these Eskimos had blonde hair and blue eyes, features prevalent in the Norse gene pool. In the 19th and 20th centuries, uh, there was a lot of interest in what happened to the last Norse Greenlanders and what happened to the colony generally. And one theory was that they had intermarried with the Inuit, the Eskimo of Greenland. 
Other evidence indicates that the missing Vikings may have gone south, winding up in an area that is now part of Minnesota. 1898, a Norwegian immigrant named Olaf Oman claims to have dug up a Viking runestone on his farm in Kensington, Minnesota. On it is carved an inscription purportedly from a lost Viking expedition to the area. But later analysis of both the stone and the language of the inscription suggest it's a fraud, perpetrated by the farmer himself. The Kensington Stone is a controversy that grows out of the intense desire on the part of Scandinavian Americans in the United States to perhaps justify their, um, their existence in North America. The most credible evidence found in the United States is a Norse penny dating from the late 11th century discovered in the trash pit of an Indian camp in Maine. How this coin got into this Indian village and into this garbage dump has to be a story in itself because it dates from a good half century after the end of the Lanzo Meadows settlement. It comes from a later period. There had to be continued contact there. But the fragile links between the Norse colonies of Iceland, Greenland, and Vinland would not endure. By 1450, Iceland loses all contact with Greenland's remaining eastern settlement. 1300 to the 1600 is a time that's often called the Little Ice Age. The danger is essentially not just from storms, but from drift ice. Small chunks of ice which come down from the northern flows are extremely dangerous to wooden ships. Iceland, too, suffers bitterly from the change in climate, but it would survive as the last outpost of Viking culture outside Scandinavia. Where you have a persistence of real traditional Scandinavian culture is in places where Scandinavian settlers, men, women, children, everybody, made up the majority of the population, as in the Northern Isles of the Orkneys and Shetlands, the Faroes, and in Iceland. On these wind-swept islands, archaeologists are slowly piecing together some of the puzzles of Viking life. These stones that you see here, this is definitely a significant building. Just when it was built, just what it is, at this moment we have no idea. And you can see these black layers. Those are ash layers from volcanoes. They're called tephra layers. This one is almost surely from the 1500s when there was a large uh, eruption. But all of the different tephra layers are coordinated with ash that fell on Greenland, and ice core samples, which are taken in Greenland, are compared to the tephra. So we have a wonderful dating system. This will tell us a lot about these stones. The traces of the Vikings that remain in the volcanic soil of Iceland, or beneath the streets of York, or the turf of Newfoundland, reveal the Vikings to be much more than the marauding horde that medieval propaganda has made them out to be. No more violent than other warriors of the age, they were far more likely to be farmers and fishermen, traders of goods from the far corners of the world, and artisans of prodigious talent. Their unique style and far-reaching vision have left an indelible mark on our modern world. They are us. They are in us. They are in our culture. They are in the language we use all the time. Uh, if you want to know what a Viking looked like, look in the mirror. Some historians have argued that the size of the Viking boats described in Norse literature was greatly exaggerated. But in 1997, archaeologists stumbled across a longship at the bottom of a Danish harbor near Copenhagen. It is the largest ever found. 120 feet long, with room for 100 men. Experts speculate the ship went down in a storm, either on its way to or returning from still another Viking conquest. Discover more about this and every History's Mysteries topic at HistoryChannel.com. I'm Arthur Kent for the History Channel. It's a civilization so vital to our way of life. Grazie, Roma. Imagining a world without their advancements in architecture. Grazie, Roma. Infrastructure. Grazie, Roma. And sanitation. Grazie, Roma. Would be impossible. Rome, Engineering an Empire, premieres Monday at 9, as only the History Channel can bring.